गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गनर शॉर्ट गनर शॉर्ट में आप सबका स्वागत है आज एक सब्जेक्ट हम बात करने वाले हैं वो है इंक्रीजिंग इंटरफेरेंस इन इंडिया इंटरनल मैटर्स एंड इस इम्पोर्टेंट टॉपिक के बारे में बात करने के लिए हमारे साथ हैं एम्बेसडर रघुनायक सर गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू गनर शॉर्ट so honored to have you here uh main sab ko bata oh thanks a lot sir uh main sab i want to tell everyone right and we're going to do this in english sir so that it goes to the international audience right right uh i want to tell everyone in a few hours ambassador trignayat is leaving for moscow to represent india in a brics conference right and uh, despite that he's come on gana shot to talk about this important subject my right? honor sir and uh, let me also tell everyone that i picked this subject up based on one of his articles which he wrote and he wrote it in hindi and i said look this is something which everyone should know i mean just to lay out the context then i'll hand it over to the ambassador if you seen in the past not just about one two months for the past two to three years i'll put it this way right there have been very disparaging remarks about india um and i see this word called elected autocracy often uh, that's a debatable thing is india an elected autocracy especially when we are going to polls in the next 15 days and where 1.4 billion people will decide who the leadership is in a absolutely fair and free manner i don't see any effect you know this is being an autocratic election it's going to be a democratic election as the next one we've heard this word called toolkits which came up during the farmers agitation the farmers agitation was a internal matter yet there were a lot of people who were interfering from outside on that there's no doubt about it. and some of them were from militant organizations let's not fool ourselves okay then you had the caa again you found interference from outside right then the issue of the arrest of the delhi chief minister you had countries giving out their thing germany us canada has been accusing us of all things interfering in their elections right and canada has made a issue out of it with the nigger killing and all that let me put things up front we are not defending india for what we are doing internally is our job we are not defending what the government is doing we are not defending you know a political party stand on a particular thing we are going to look at it pretty objectively from a sovereignty point of view that is the prime thing whether the farm laws are correct ca is correct or not or whether the arrest of the delhi cm is correct or not is for the law of the land to decide it is for the people to decide it is for our courts to decide it is for our institutions to decide it is not for germany or you know canada or uk or usa or anyone else to say you should do this or not and we can i mean as we go down the line i will also show how we could also respond it and there is it's not as if they don't have their fallacies and they don't have their cracks and there is no absolute absolute democracy anywhere in the world just as there is no absolute autocracy in anywhere in the world there is no absolute democracy each democracy is based on the requirements of the land and the people and their conditions and their economy and their culture and their history right in such conditions is it fair for others to interfere in what we are doing internally i don't think so i mean let me be upfront on it and the ambassador also doesn't think so and please remember those of you who are seeing this uh, you know video you're looking at the ambassador of india and a general of the indian army standing up for the sovereignty of india it is not for any other you know debate whether what we are doing is right or wrong okay 
if there's a debate on what is we are doing right or wrong it's for the internal people of india anyone in india can question us why are you defending this is it indefensible it's not so we're looking at the sovereignty part of it right that's the whole story and we're not looking at politically like i said we're doing it objectively with this so i'll hand it over to you and then we'll take it up with your views and because you done research on it and you've written about it i would like to give you i mean i would like to you to give your views on it thank you sir, you, sir. thank you sir jana shankar it is uh, always a great pleasure uh, to be on your gunner shot which is an amazing channel and i always watch myself and learn a lot uh, all through and you so very rightly said about various issues that are being raised in the last few years so firstly let me try to say the why is it so and definitely it's a question of sovereignty our decision india is not a banana republic we have a fully functioning democracy which has all its uh, tools and uh, pedestals working perfectly fine we have a very vibrant uh, judiciary which decides on the rule of law uh, that prevails in the country no country is perfect no system is perfect and as you said no democracy is perfect but india has the, is not only the largest democracy but we have a very very ancient traditions of democracy and dialogue and diplomacy when we talk whatever we are talking we are talking essentially what we practice ourselves so that's why there is no question but india is such a large country also i i remember when i was posted in sweden sir the population of sweden was just about 9 million and they would be carping on everything that is done in india poverty the problems the nuclear uh, issues and everything without really correlating at that time with our external environment and so i used to go and talk to the media there to the uh, policy makers and others i said look you are not in half of delhi's municipality and you have problems also within your country so what i always say and the americans or the britishers or the canadians or these holy of the die attitude that these countries adopt and think it is a matter of their right to interfere and comment on everything that happens in other countries i would say that it's an old saying that you should not cast a stone when you are living in a glass house yourself a majority of countries and if you see the reports that come from transparency international and several others the very first pages will be filled with the kind of racism the comments the kind of discrimination happening against minorities and other issues in their countries and nobody cares about it nobody talks about it but everything that happens in india they will be definitely commenting on it and you mentioned about calling india an autocracy i i feel why they are calling it so because they have become so used to the autocratic growth of china which they have enabled themselves so when they are seeing a country like china in the past with a totalitarian regime has been able to reach at such heights now they are thinking that india is also moving in the same direction because we are the purchasing power parity wise the third largest economy the largest democracy the biggest peace keeping operations we participate all the time is the biggest market the greatest youth dividend that india has at least for next 30 20 30 years and is hoping to become a developed country now there was another uh, on the twitter and some other social media handles i saw that in terms of purchasing power parity as of this month india has become sure. the second largest economy sir so now this is something that is not really in my view palatable to these countries so they have to start finding fight i don't say that we are perfect we have our problems problems happen in every country but look at the 1.4 billion people and some some countries the other most powerful country today has about 300 maximum now with that kind of a thing then look at the amount of problems and how those problems are being handled you look at the poverty everybody will talk oh india is so much poverty and you are talking about being a second uh, largest economy or whatever it is and you have big ambitions but look at how many poor in the country but they would not say sir that you had 
brought out so many pe poor people out of the poverty, which is a kind of a, a, an example in itself. So they, they, they cannot, they need India because India has arrived in a great way in, in many senses. Strategically, the economic pivot is moving towards India. So what they try to do is try to keep you on tenter hooks. And that is the strategy which all, I mean, uh, defense people know much better, sir, about this gray warfare uh, strategy in which gray zone warfare, in which, of course, uh, China is a master. The Western countries are masters. We have seen the kind of narratives that are being paddled during the Russia-Ukraine war, Israel-Hamas war, one-sided stories. It's absolutely uh, trying to just put something what you want to convey. There are, they are interfering in this through cyber attacks, through various kinds of means and tools available to them. You mentioned about the uh, farmer's agitation. It is a problem of India. There were certain rules that were agreed. Certain laws were passed. They were not acceptable. They were withdrawn. But there is a way to do it in a democracy. People do protest and it is allowed. But they make it into a very big deal and try to say that this is, should not happen or that should not happen. In fact, without knowing what is happening in the country, they would be trying to provide you solutions which are not workable. Now, the hypocrisy of these countries, I would say, sir, is very clearly evident. For example, they will come up with various studies. They have their own uh, standards of judging people. Then they will bring out the VDAM and some other, those kind of institutions, which will say, well, India's democracy index is even below Pakistan. Now, any sensible person, can he, or they put you in the happiness index below Afghanistan. <laughs> How could you imagine that this kind of a thing, what kind of a credibility they have? They don't even look at what they have written, frankly. So it seems either they are sitting in their own glass house <clears throat> and churning out these reports essentially to annoy India so that you become on the defensive and you take diktat from there, which is not going to happen. India has a strong government, a strong polity, a strong economy and a civilizational heritage. And... Secondly, what they don't like very much, sir, we, G20, I will just give you one example. Because the way India conducted the G20, the way we arrived at various uh, congruences with different partners and the fighting countries among themselves, with the two superpowers on the, each side of the aisle, we were able to bring about that. That is something that they find grudgingly accept India's role, grudgingly. But don't want it to become a narrative by India. That's what we have done. So this, these are the kind of things that have given them uh, a, some kind of a strategy they have created every time. And now this time we are hearing in much more and we will, I'm sure till June happens, we will have many more like that. Now, if a chief minister, if he is accused of doing something wrong, should the law not take its course? Which country? I mean, they themselves have sometimes... Uh, put people behind bars who have violated the uh, the tax laws or other laws or their criminal activities. But no, we do not talk about that because this is an internal matter, how they handle their governance architecture. On the other hand, this... yeah. yes, sir, this is the same thing, like you're mentioning. We don't say that they have done the tax embezzlement of this and that. So I feel, sir, that we will need to be prepared and uh, prepared in and countermeasures because, see, this is not something which is one-off. We will continue to face it going forward more and more. So we'll have to find ways where we have a robust communication strategy, which personally I feel today, uh, in my view, is probably lacking in content and lacking in the drive and lacking in the force. So I feel that it is very important because this is going to be a, a war that will have to be fought, this information warfare, which have to be fought in that space. And with the social media, it has become far more invidious. So I think that uh, India will have to continue to work a lot on this and not bother. I mean, you have seen that another hypocrisy, sir, I would like to mention. We have seen the two cases of Niger and for example, Pannu, the two I will just mention, Canada and USA. In the garb of their sovereignty, 
or under the garb of human rights or whatever it is, they started accusing India of doing something. And India said, we don't do it. But if you have an evidence, bring it. We will jointly, we will look at it, investigate that. But that's not acceptable. Off and on and off and on, they will continue to bring it up. But the fact remains is that they are not talking about, they are talking about a person who went illegally. They just took him into the country, gave him refuge. And then they are making a hero out of him. A terrorist being made a hero out of it. So what they are doing is they are creating the constituencies of terrorists and extremists to operate outside as a tool kit for them. So that is something that needs to be exposed. What is more important? Do you consider, are they considering that good terrorist and bad terrorist is the right way to go ahead? Or my terrorist is better than yours? That you can't take any action against them? International Court of Justice, United Nations institutions, multilateral institutions are all totally defunct today or ineffective. So it has become just like that, my way or highway. That is the kind of situation, sir, which is happening. And in that, it is absolutely an imperative that uh, we need to work on it while, of course, addressing our weaknesses. If there is a friendly criticism, if there are weaknesses, they come up. We know them, but sometimes they are flagged by others. They should be addressed by us also. So I would like to add a few issues to what you have said and which is something which all of us need to understand. And which I think anyone who sees this program also needs to understand. The first is, you know, India, I think, has reached at a place where we are unstoppable anymore. And I'll give you the reasons for this. You look at the economies which are ahead of us, leave USA out, China, Japan, and Germany. These are the three economies ahead of us. These three economies had a peace dividend, anything ranging from the Second World War and China from 1790. They have not fought a war. We've had wars right through 47, 65, 71, Kargil, 62, then the proxy war which we fought, then the Eastern Ladakh intrusions. We've been fighting every 10 years of war. Take it into account. Second, these three economies were aided economies. They were restructured and aided by the USA I mean, and the West for whatever reasons. I have no problem with it, but they have done it. No one has aided us so far. We are not an aided economy. No one has aided us to become where we are. Third, through these years, till as recent as the S-400 deal, We've been under sanctions. Even this S-400 deal, people were contemplating putting us under sanctions and CATSA. Whether when we fired our own missiles or when we did our nuclear test, we were put under severe sanctions, MTCR and what have you. A post economy, completely under sanctions, a war torn economy. This is our history. And don't forget the kind of disasters we faced. Despite that, we are the fourth, la fifth largest economy today, about to become fourth. I think we've, or we've become fourth, um, right? And to be the third largest economy in a matter of time. It's a matter of time. We all know that. And in my opinion, this is what scares the West. Yes. In the case of China, they, they are pulling the plug. You can make it out. They're pulling the plug out of China and it is good. You know, because China has grown to a place where it cannot be managed. It has to be contained in some manner. We are okay with it. Whereas India can't be stopped. You might be delayed, but you can't be stopped. One. Number two, which many people will agree with me, and I'm sure those countries who have criticized us also know that without India, those people also can't contain China. After all, they've Con, you know, made a monster out of China. Now you, it's very difficult to control the dragon. Pele the dragon nahi tha, dragon aa gaya. Usko kaise sambaloge? So you need a heavyweight next to you. And if you need an alternate to China, it is India in size and scale. There's no other country in the world. You can take some industries to Mexico. You can take some industry to Malaysia. 
सम टू वेट टाइम बट वो तो चुनमुन है अल्टीमेटली पीपल हैव टू कम टू इंडिया दिस इज व्हाट आई थिंक वरीज देम लाइक यू राइटली सेड विल इंडिया गो आउट ऑफ देयर ग्रिप इन माय वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट इट इज इंडिया हैज नेवर बीन इन देयर ग्रिप वी हैव नेवर बीन इन देयर ग्रिप इन फैक्ट फॉर पीपल हु हैव फॉगटन राइट एज लेट एज 98 right till even the uh, the cargill operation uh, usa was no friend of ours it was only after that our relationship changed with mr strop talbert and uh, 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 late uh, raksha mantri just one thing as uh, for minister yeah they were the ones who changed the relationship and our strategic relationship with usa is a work in progress it's not complete we are not in any case we'll never be allies to them but it's a work in progress while that is being so there is a element in the usa and in the west who are critical of all our standards like you rightly said they don't understand what we face we don't ex- we don't you know we don't hide our pro- poverty if you go to china their poverty is hidden we don't hide our poverty we say this is our poverty we'll tackle it I mean, I remember someone telling us every year we take one Australia out of poverty. This is something which I was told by an Australian. I I, I didn't know. I mean, I might be wrong. I might not be wrong. But this is all the potential of this country. We have never had a you know a change of power through all this seventy-five years has been peaceful through the ballot. People have. transition of power has been absolutely the biggest democracy in the world, earth has had peaceful transition of power it doesn't matter who's at the center someone at the state might be different it doesn't matter who's at the state someone might at the center might be different we have the vote of power it doesn't matter if it was indira gandhi or pv narsimha rao or mr modi every 5 years they had to come in front of the janta and said janta janardhan hai please do this votes bilkul if we all of us decide tomorrow if mr modi is not to be our prime minister in the, and be given a third term it will not be given and it's the people who decide it Wait. how are we a elected autocracy autocracy every leader has a autocratic attitude every leader has a democratic attitude i mean when people say mr modi is an autocrat i agree but is a full autocrat he couldn't even put the law formulas through autocrat hota <laughs> formulas ho jata abhi tak hai na so wo kaise hai why should he come to chennai and do road shows to get a few votes no the problem oh. with the uh, self the problem is with the west is that it is a design thing it is not something design. which is one off so it's yeah. a part as we mentioned toolkit so it is a part of the toolkit toolkit to create so we are create chaos and create doubts yes isse kya hai ki all of us start looking at each other and pointing fingers at each other and then yes, like you do. rightly said transparency international amnesty international ye kuch dal denge human rights ke bare mein aap i mean how can you think of having a you know democracy less than pakistan <laughs> and uh, you know human rights situation or you know uh, happiness index less than afghanistan i mean this is and then i mean it is in incredulous like absolutely the next point which you pointed out which is very important that we are under a gray zone war we are under a information war what we need to understand and i think we which you rightly brought out is that we are under this kind of information campaign from two sides one is the west who are supposed to be our friends who they expect us to cooperate with to contain china that is the larger aim they let's not let's not you know fiddle around uh, with semantics we are doing that okay on the other hand you have, have uh, yeah one minute on the other hand you have uh, you know this uh, Pakistan and China carrying out their own information war against us. So in this kind of a con, I think it's time. Like what you write, it definitely 
a plan, a national strategic plan of communication. Right? And right. how we do it, I have to involve all our ministries, everything and then everything, and do a, the whole thing. So this is, I thought I'll put across some of my views, you put across your views. I would like you to say, comment on all this and highlight a few of these issues. Then we can, we can take questions. If you have more, we can carry on. Oh, sure, sir. Absolutely. I mean, what you said was correct. And I was talking to some of the Americans who were visiting here. And uh, when they started talking about China and Pakistan and this and that issue. And uh, so I told them, I said, tell us one thing. Now we are friends. And as you rightly mentioned in the 71 and 98 till 98, uh, they were just looking at us in, in, the, in their own uh, Cento and uh, those kind of alliance mindset and uh, virtually against India to a great extent. I said, look, who has created our problem? Created what you have done, emboldened China, empowered China economically and otherwise that was your policy, your policy failures that have brought it to this point. You, have, you are the ones who have sustained Pakistan and helped its terror until 9-11. Correct. And even now, what you are doing is uh, trying to play one against the other on the chess game, chess board. So when you say that India is a friend, India, like the American ambassador now here is singing different kind of tones now, uh, saying that if you want to see the, the great power and this, that, you will come to India and see. That's a good thing. That's a good realization. But I hope it is not only for the media's sake. That is also adopted by the deep state, which is involved in a very different kind of a ball game. I understand that very often what happens, the USA is essentially run by lobbies. And so there are anti-India lobbies also in the country. There are others. So sometimes those lobbies affect it. I remember once I was, uh, when I was posted in the US, one of the uh, senators told that the sweet, more the sweet you put in, sweeter it becomes. No. So if, if that that is the kind of attitude, so they, that's also their internal dynamic. And secondly, the, we have elections there. So whatever is their perception of the democracy, which is also faulted, I guess, it is, as you rightly mentioned, the transition of power last time we have seen uh, on January 6th in 2020. Yep. That what happened there? You know, it has never happened in India. So no. they, their institutions are also under tremendous stress today. And then they, they, there is a great difference here. India practices democracy and they have a project democracy. And the project democracy also involves regime change as a part of this agenda. Likewise for China. China also adopts these methodologies to their advantage yeah, against yeah. India every day. And they have power, they have money, so they just buy out various uh, these kind of embedded uh, institutions, be it the big newspapers, media outlets, or the uh, people who make policies. So that's how they are doing it in a very big way. And uh, we have all in our service dealt with these kind of things. Uh, but what I feel is sir, that it is important. This is going to continue to happen. And I also say now, I mean, like you have just put up one slide about one of the countries, Germany. India must also have a comprehensive concerted strategy and a proper arm of the government, which should have comprehensive inputs, must be ready with the kind of things about other places, what is happening there, on facts, not on uh, this kind of a war. Yeah, yeah. But you can like, count on it with this facts. In, this is in Britain. And yeah. if you search the net, you come come to come across so many things. So I can all of out of the blue i can start a twitter thing and start uh, criticizing them absolutely i mean i remember when i used to go to the foreign offices that they start talking about human rights and minority and this and that i said come to india this is what minorities you are talking about our minorities are bigger than 10 times your country size <laughs> so what are you talking about so they have really no clue of the size they don't understand the whole dimension of the issues and they start thinking about one news item gathered from there, uh, uh, an entire group talking something there. That becomes a news for them and they start chasing that. The idea is not that. And, and another thing, sir, I would like to say that one thing that they have not been able to digest till today is that India's strategic autonomy approach. 
that how can a country like India, which is according to them, is very developing. Sometimes they say it's a developed country. They, they're just trying to make up their mind in that sense. Can take an independent decision. That is something that is not acceptable. Apart from the fact that we are growing economically, as you rightly mentioned, despite a teen number of roadblocks. But they are, in that sense, trying to just create a, an internal dissent in the way. And of course, in a democracy, there are political parties, groups, there are others who are willing to buy that narrative against the ruling party. That normally happens everywhere. So this is what causes a lot of confusion in the country. And a lot of uh, smoke, I would say, uh, is created by them that is harmful. So we need to be very, very vigilant about it, sir. I, I think you're perfectly right, sir. I, I have no doubt about it. And my message, if I have to, if there's an international viewer watching this, is this. If you're trying to, you know, trying to destabilize India, you will not do it. I mean, people must understand. Many people have tried it before and India has never been destabilized. That's the first part of the story. If you think India will take prescriptions from others, that also won't happen. India will do what is good for India. <clears throat> we will not do anything which is good for either UK, USA, Germany, Pakistan or China. We will do it in our national interest, taking into account what is good for the poorest man in this country. We accept that we have poverty. We have to look after the poorest man. That when we make that poorest man a little less poorer, we will be a better country. We are aware of that. Absolutely. Okay. We we know the wealth disparity in our country. And it is not good for us. But in a democracy, these are things which will happen and we understand that. Right? We also understand there we have a problem of caste, race, creed still there in our culture it is we it's a culture which has come we have a problem of ethnicity we have a problem of religiosity because we are a pluralistic country what exists in the eastern part of the country does not exist in the east, western part of the country and is dissimilar to what is in the southern part of the country and completely different from the northern part of the country you have to go through india to realize with every two streets you go, the language changes and the ethnicity changes. You will never understand it. Right? So, this is a myriad country. It is not a monolithic like country like China. We are not in competition with China. Let me also put it. We have to grow as India. We don't want to grow as another China. That's the worst case. Worst fate which can be, befall a country is to become another China. Very true. Where a person can't open his mouth. <laughs> Diversity right? is our strength. They are, yes, our strength, like the ambassador brought out, is our diversity. It is the dissimilar people who make this society and make give us the strength. We are a society which has accepted religions. We are a society which has exported religions. We might have perturbations in all this, but we will get through it ultimately. Yes. Like I said, we have so many handicaps, but despite that, please understand, we have become the fourth largest economy. And we are PPP terms, we could be second, we could be third, depending on which rating you see. We will have many problems, we will have many eruptions, we know that, but we'll handle it. Right. right? So I would suggest, and I'm, that's what the good ambassador is also trying to suggest to all of you. You know, don't expect India to be like what your country is. Don't judge us by your metrics. Judge us by our metrics. And we know our metrics. We judge. We Our aspirations are based on our metrics. Right? This is what I thought I will put across. So you could sum it up and then we'll take a few questions. Well, sir, I think you very rightly uh, put everything. I believe that <clears throat> they should also try to put their own house in order first. That's very important. They have their challenges, both geopolitical and otherwise. India is in a sweet spot today. It is a swing power and uh, a power which follows a principled foreign policy, I would say, in the international discourse, not to undermine countries, not to attack countries, but uh, to build friendships and bridges. And the only country that can possibly build bridges between North and South and East and West is India today. And that's why every country looks up to India in a way. 
and do appreciate it. But sooner they start working it and they stop prescribing something, um, uh, you know, like a doctor who, who has not seen a patient and just tells you eat this medicine or that medicine. So I think that that is something they should develop proper knowledge about India and then only start thinking about what it is. Yeah, I, I think completely, sir. We'll take a few questions because I think we have a lot of questions. I'd request you to go a little fast because yeah. we'll try and answer as many questions as you. Sure. Yes. Uh, Amitesh Behra says, I'll, he's, it's in two parts. I'll read through it and put the second one up. So whenever any international agency and international media appreciate Bharat, we take full credit of it. But when they speak against us, we tell it is a conspiracy. If we take full credit on appreciation, then we should not deny uh, their accusation on us. Sir, is this not hypocrisy? I'm a very proud Indian, but I, do not, I cannot deny this fact. No, I would say to Amitesh that we are not trying to defend the indefensible. There are weaknesses, but those weaknesses, only we can handle them. And we will be able to do that. But then you have to see the intent of those countries and the agencies. I mean, I mentioned about the democracy index. I mentioned about the, uh, the about other Definitely. countries, you know, and so many things. And then you are going to tell us uh, that, you know, there, there's no democracy in India. Now, how do you, from that judgment, those kind of your base that you come from, uh, you can arrive at the right conclusion. That is what we are challenging. Nothing else. So we are not saying yeah. we don't have problems. We have, India is in a good place. It will continue to rise. That's it. And we were, we, we are not deriving something out of nothing. We were a great country. We provided 27% of the global GDP. We are just getting back to our own old station in life. Yeah. It's called restitution. You know, there's yeah. a physical term for it. It's called restitution. Yeah. We are restituting back to our past. Yes. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, General Namaskar, it is good to see Bharat responding well to overt interference, but it is reported there are covert interference too. Is it true and is the response as good? Well, I think, sir, that uh, he rightly mentioned there are psyops, there are cyber attacks, there are all kinds of uh, covert interference in India's affairs. And that is the way uh, today the international relations are also conducted. Oh, yeah. So we are seeing that. That's the, that's the way. And we are able to counter them as much as we can. And I think the government is very much aware of it. Yeah, I think so. And it is not only the government. Even the people are aware of it. That's right. The awareness in the people is phenomenal. When you go and speak to people on the street, the awareness is phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, most citizens of Bharat are aware of this. Foreigners attempt to interfere in our internal matters. We are taking corrective steps. Yeah, that's what he has also said, citizens. Yes, we are taking corrective steps and actions in real time and even on social media now. Your views? Well, that's right. I mean, absolutely. Uh, we are, and it is also for today's. The thing is that uh, we have citizen journalists. So a large number of people are on social media, they understand. Those who are Indians, they are living in India, they do understand uh, what is the truth. So when these kind of canards are being spread, the people rise to this and as well as the agencies and the government also does it. So we need to basically find what is the truth, not necessarily just get carried away what somebody else says. Yeah. Uh no nation is an island as far as geopolitics is concerned. India must learn to take external criticism constructively if it aspires to be a major global power. Well, of course, that is a fact. I mean, uh, external criticism for what? I mean, you are, we are a sovereign country. We need to understand what are the limitations within India. We do understand that. We are addressing them. That's how India is progressing. It's as simple as that. At the same time, the standards that those countries apply are so hypocritical. On a day-to-day -day discourse, you can just shut them out. And then you think that that criticism should be taken constructively. I'm, I'm afraid that will be very difficult to understand. Yep. Uh, right. Next question, sir. Do you really think Pakistan can focus on the Northeast, Kerala and Chhattisgarh? Can you help me answer my question? Yeah, he <laughs> gave this question yesterday also in... Okay. One of the other things. Well, but sir, I think that uh, th this is uh, something, what a little I know of it, that you see the Pakistan's 
foreign policy towards India is driven by the zero-sum game, number one. And number two, by using cross-border terrorism as the, the basically an instrument of their foreign policy. So what they have created is in the recent past or for, I mean, at least 30 years I know of, they have been creating these sleeper cells. But I must say that they have not been very successful uh, in destabilizing India because today India has been able to work out the country is together. We will continue to have these kind of events because this is their design and they'll continue to do so. But I think that they have run out of trouble and now being afflicted by the same uh, uh, instrument themselves, uh, basically from Afghanistan, from all over the places, the country is falling apart. So I'm not that worried about Pakistan. But the problem yeah, I is agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree with the ambassador completely. Pakistan is something we should not be worried about. It's a permanent irritant and leave it at that. You know, yesterday, sir, we did the we did a show on you know the collusion between Pakistan and China. Yeah. The phrase which kept coming back to my mind is China is your primary adversary and Pakistan is your permanent irritant. Yeah. And it will keep irritating you. And don't worry about Northeast Kerala and Chhattisgarh, they can't do much beyond the point. And the capability of Pakistan to instigate terror in our hinterland has gone down significantly. Right? We leave it at that. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Uh, many global leaders feel that India should not be able to be the new China. Is this limited to the expansionist and inclusive nature of CCP or something more? Do we want to be the next China? So I don't think we want to be next China. I mean, we, you have already very clearly said that we want to be a resurgent India. That's it. Yeah, that's it. We don't want to be another China at all. That's the worst phase, uh, yes. you know, fate which can befall any nation. Yeah. Does the rule-based order benefit us? If not, why do we persist with it? Well, sir, I think that there have to be certain rules for the international discourse. The only problem with the rules has been, I mean, which were basically uh, typecast uh, in the uh, Second World after the Second World War mainly. The problem with them is that the countries that have really crafted those rules and regulations and those institutions have unfortunately violated them the most. And that is yeah. why the, there is nothing wrong with the rules. So there have to be rules. And that's what in the Indo-Pacific, everywhere India says that there should be a rule-based order. We are not for containment of China or anything. But at the same time, there should be a rule-based order. And if there are no rules, it will be extremely difficult to operate. Then this will be a law of the jungle. Everybody will do what they please. And then you will have more wars, more discontent, and more destruction in the world. Rohan Indra he says, why do Western governments like to lecture countries on human rights? I am an Indian diaspora who has grown up in the West and people here don't even think of India human rights. So why UK, US, etc. comment? Well, we have the, in this whole discussion, this is what we have uh, actually talked about. That <laughs> this is their, their deep state in their country. Yeah. Which finds, which has to, which is in their toolkit, as simple as that. I mean, and they need to do that in order to put down the other countries, which are just coming up economically, politically, foreign policy wise, and otherwise in every which way. And so, obviously, yeah. this is something the uh, they are unable to adjust to the new reality of the world. Okay, uh, Ambassador Sir, you mentioned Pannu question. As a Punjabi, I think Canada, U.S., West. Be littles are right to live peacefully in Punjab and is racist and lack of respect of our life's safety. Your views? Well, I fully agree with you. I mean, they are, what they are doing is, I think they should have to do soul searching. And I can only give an example of Pakistan to them. Or if they like them so much. I mean, another thing is that why don't they create uh, a land for them and they can live happily there? Instead of trying to create instability in India, and in the on the contrary, when India reacts, then they become very defensive, and then they want to go on uh, become ultra moralist. I mean, those that kind of hypocrisy has to be really exposed, and I'm afraid that uh, this is something that they will eventually understand. Yeah. 
Now, Abhijit Mukherjee is a little aggressive. I think he's okay. But we, we, we'll read it out. India should simply say, who the hell are you? A third party singular in number. To comment about us, you better keep your dirty mouth shut. Don't get too angry about it. But you have to see it diplomatically. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and we, commu see, we, we communicate. I can give you an example. Like, for example, when uh, the we were started buying oil, our foreign minister, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, was confronted there. And he gave a response very nicely. He, he said that what you are importing in, uh, in an afternoon, we are importing in one month from the Russian oil. So that was a very good enough answer like that. So we don't have to tell them. They'll shut up by themselves eventually. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll not take comments on our internal politics because that's not what we are listing. So right, we'll, I'll just take your views on. Uh, okay, this is an interesting question. Let's. Uh, South African countries are with China or with India? Uh, well, I think that. Uh, it is very difficult to say. I think that every country has to look at its own interest. Uh, China has been very aggressive in whole of Africa. And not from now, for quite some time. Uh, I was posted first time in Africa in 1983. So from then on, I have seen how the Chinese have moved around in the countries. And at that time, we had some kind of an ad hoc policies. And so very often we saw that... Uh, we either we did not have the resources, but still we were providing them all the capacity building assistance. So at the grassroots level, at the goodwill level, I think they prefer India. They connect with India much better. But since economically, uh, China has been able to engage with them with various projects and all. So they have good relations with them as well. Uh, I would not say, but there many of these countries are facing these debt traps. And so I think that that is eventually giving them some jitters now. India, on the other hand, has come up, as you know, Prime Minister Modi came out with his policy when he was addressing Kam in Kampala. The first time we have had a proper crafted African policy. And that policy was the basic thing about that is that Africa for the Africans. Africans. Let them tell what they want. And what India did in G20, no other country had done before. China had also oh. hosted uh, the G20. We got the African Union into it and Union, made G20 yeah. into G21. So I think that they understand it. South Africa is a great friend of ours. And so are the many countries there. Well, I'll just add on to what the ambassador has said. I think this is important from the perspective, the larger perspective of India. If you remember, the head of the African Union said India is a superpower. As far as he is concerned, India is a superpower. In G20, he made this statement. It's not a small statement to make. The second thing is, you see the uh, foreign policy of Kenya. It has changed in the past few years. Earlier, it was Kenya was, la I, I wouldn't say anti-Indian, but it was ambivalent to India. But if you see that, I think the president came to India recently, sir. And he's now looking at a, a different relationship with India. And if you see that, so you, you, you see this changing. Okay, at this point of time, maybe many countries, like you said, are in the debt trap and they're with China, but many of them are seeking a way out. And like what he said, which is very important, India did something for Africa, which I don't think they'll ever forget. They brought the entire Africa into G20. I think that's huge. Okay. Uh, he says... He, India is trying to be a middle power among Brazil, Germany, and South Africa. Is India trying to be a middle power? Uh, well, India is a, uh, India is a rising power, I would say. And uh, in many ways, it is a country which is developed, and certain countries is developing. And we are aiming to become a developed power, a developed country by 2047. That is the aim of the government. But it is a power which follows a sane foreign policy. That is the most important thing. That's why the world is looking at us. We have become the voice of the global south, not because we are like that, but because they trust us. They believe that we are going to get the best deal for them. So we are not in competition with Germany, Brazil, or South Africa. They're all our partners uh, and friends. Uh, and we are working um, in the direction of carving our own uh, independent place in the world, which follows a benign foreign policy. 
ओके सर मैं छत्तीसगढ़ से हूँ यहाँ नेक्सल कब तक खत्म हो पाएगा राइट ये मैं समझता हूँ कि जब नेक्सल का जो चैलेंज है ये मल्टीपल फ्रंट्स पे है डेवलपमेंटल फ्रंट है एक दूसरा बाहर का इंटरफेरेंस है कंट्रीज के अंदर तीसरा पॉवर्टी भी है उन सब चीजों को देखना एक होलिस्टिक अप्रोच होगा जहां तक मैं समझता हूं कि काफी कम हो गया है नक्सल चैलेंज अभी और सरकार भी मेरे ख्याल से पूरी तरह से लगी हुई है उसमें तो देखिए ये सब चीजें टाइम लगती है इनमें लेकिन धीरे धीरे कब्जे में आएगा जैसे ऐसे वो लोग इंटीग्रेटेड होते हैं पूरी तरह से मिस गाइडेड यूथ है एंड मैं ये भी बताना चाहता हूँ दो हजार दस की बात है मैं एक डिवीजन को टेक ओवर किया था उन दिनों में नक्सलवादी जो है इस इलाके में छत्तीसगढ़ और मध्य प्रदेश और इस इलाके में काफी फैला हुआ था तो उस वक्त आई वाज ऑलमोस्ट ऑर्डर टू गो इन टू दिस एरिया टू स्टार्ट टेकिंग ओवर द प्लेस एंड यू नो डू वट आई मीन लाइक एनी अदर थिंग बट वट एवर रीजन इट डेंट है ओके व्हेन आई लुक उस वक्त का देखता हूं और आज का देखता हूं बिल्कुल बहुत फर्क है जमीन आसमान का फर्क है बहुत हालत सुधर गया पर जैसे आप बता रहे हो और भी सुधरने की जरूरत है राइट ओके दिस अ क्वेश्चन लेट मी टेक इट फॉर सर व्हाट हैपेंस इफ चाइना रशिया एंड इंडिया कम टुगेदर then where will west go <laughs> well i think that that's a very ideal scenario mm-hmm. uh, it is started off uh, when i was in moscow i remember posted there at that time wahan ke jo jo russia's prime minister was primakov and he came up with this idea of uh, rick russia mm-hmm. india and china this organization was launched there was a meeting of the foreign ministers and which then later on also became the head of state level Uh, this was not supposed to be a block the problem is that while russia and india has lot of convergences and no problem relationship the relationship with china remains fundamentally and systematically problematic and therefore the coming together with china in the near future i don't see any major because china does not respect the rule of law does not respect the agreements it signs does not respect the panchil principle but it only feels that whatever it says is correct that's the problem with china and it wants india to remain confined to the south asian landscape and as long as that is their approach i don't see that happening secondly india does not believe in block politics so that is why now that the world is moving towards broadly in a cold war 2.0 kind of scenario at least in the geopolitical sense we may have a geo economic multipolarity but geopolitically there would still be the two parts and then you will see india emerging as a pole by itself which will be uh, looking after the interests of most of the developing world okay if foreign powers are reiterating our lack of commitment to our own constitutional values we need to focus on improving ourselves not their agenda well i think we have to do both we have to look at their agenda counter it and at the same time we we'll look in words and whatever is wrong with us we must correct it yeah i think so and of course uh, from p gurus this is a thing with three years put like like guys this is a superb discussion i have Thank no you. doubts about it we have been very open about the whole affair right and we've been objective not subjective right we are not political it is a completely a political discussion and that's how it is so uh, okay uh, off the cuff but we'll let me this thing do you feel china is behind the middle east tension since an alternative to their belt and road was unveiled in g20 no i don't think so i mean um, west asia is one area in which i am uh, quite well involved and i don't see that it was china created this middle east problem israel and palestine issue or rather the israel hamas conflict is essentially due to non resolution of the palestinian issue and as long as the fundamental aspect is not addressed it will be extremely difficult 
uh, to find any kind of a modus vivendi in the region. So I think that uh, it is not that. Of course, uh, indirect uh, effect of this war that is ongoing between Israel and Hamas is that currently the IMAC, especially as far as the Saudi Arabia component is concerned, is on a back burner or a hold. But at the same time, India, UAE and Greece are continuing to progress on this uh, project in a full-fledged manner. As you know, Prime Minister's visit to UAE. And I want to also tell you this. I mean, uh, being an, uh, basically a commentator on West Asian of a student of West Asian Affairs, I can say, tell you one thing is that in India's foreign policy toolkit today, the best uh, results that have been obtained are in our West Asia policy. Yeah, I think so. so we, our West Asia policy is a success because we have one large part of the West Asia on our side. And that is why you find that our Kashmir problem has also come to hand. And you just see the latest statement uh, from I don't know that uh, joint statement between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Pakistan, absolutely. You will see how the thing is because Pakistan has gone flat after that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. India showed a model, working model for G20, but because of round robin model, do existing powers have incentive to indulge in degrading its effectiveness? Is shared responsibility realistic? Well, I think that uh, you see the only problem with the G20 is that it is a recommendatory body by consensus. So it is presumed that once a consensus has been achieved, the top countries and the economies of the world will follow those rules and they are being implemented by different other institutional mechanisms. So I think that what we are talking about is the shared responsibility essentially lies in two things very importantly at this stage. Uh, or third one also now, the AIA and others have come up. The first one is climate change. So in the climate change, there is no point, No, there is, we don't have much time left. So we have to address it head on and the countries have to work together for this. That is, uh, otherwise it's a societal thing that we are uh, heading for. Other one is terrorism, in which countries are still uh, following a discriminatory path and uh, supporting terrorism in some part and saying something else elsewhere. Uh, so I think that that is one. And thirdly, of course, in the artificial intelligence, financing and others, uh, those reforms of the institutions, those are very important. Now, more and more people are talking about it. There are certain people, they may not be happy, but at the end of the day, what we are looking at is, are the broader things which are far more important to be addressed and that have been addressed under India's presidency. Yeah. So I'll take this last question because it's Sir. an interesting question. So, can you say several bad things that China did to explain why China doesn't respect rule of law, why China has no principles, why China is bad? Well, I want to say that the, the biggest thing about China is that China follows a policy of deception. It's a master in the art of deception. It is now, it does not recognize today the current existing order as it prevails, it does not subscribe to it. It has come up with its own new initiative, a new kind of an order that it wants to impose on the world. For example, it's global security initiative, it's global developmental initiative, global cultural and civilizational initiative, it's Belt and Road, and they're non-transparent. Now, I would not say, secondly, I would just for a thing that directly impacts us apart from the border uh, problems that we have with China, which we are handling very well. The problem, look at this. China says on the one hand that it is uh, suffering from terrorism and there is a fight against terrorism in the uh, platforms everywhere he'll speak. But when it comes to terrorists from Pakistan, it puts a technical hold in the UN Security Council committees. Now, that kind of an hypocrisy doesn't pay. And we have seen what happened to their own engineers in Pakistan. So that is something that China will have to understand. But China thinks that it has arrived on the global stage. It can replace uh, the existing order. It can be a counter to the American influence. So we'll have to see how it plays out. I'll give you two concrete examples why China, where China does not respect the rule of law. Concrete. One, Hong Kong. The way it has usurped Hong Kong 
despite a treaty. It has just broken a treaty and usurped Hong Kong 25 years ahead of time. Second, you see the 11 dash line that turned into 9 dash line and now it has turned into a 10 dash line. Okay, so there's no rule and it, it, is, it was never there. So I'm just giving you two concrete examples. I can we can give more, but what the ambassador said is more relevant. You have to look at it at the larger picture as to what China does. So I think we've uh, yes, sir. <laughs> done the whole thing. We've had some tremendous discussion. Uh, many, might, many might think it is, you know, this is a different kind of a discussion we've had. But I thought we should have this talk and to say, look, uh, and this message goes out to people. There those of you who are seeing from abroad, show it to your friends. Those of you who are within, just send it to your friends to say what are the issues which are there when others tell us and start interfering in our affairs. And on the contrary, if you see, we've never done that outside to anyone else. We've not told UK to behave the way it should or USA, despite all that. So that's what I thought in this thing. And in the end, uh, thank you for all, all of you for attending. And I must thank the ambassador thank for you, coming just before he's going to uh, Russia. So nice of you, sir. Thank and you, I'm sir. honored that you made it possible. No, no, to it's come my out. honor, sir. Great pleasure. Thanks a lot. And good evening and Jai Hind to all of you. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind, sir. Thank you.